We're talking about Gerson Yabaselli again already? Hello, Emmett Ryan here from Ball on Europe, and it is great to be back with you again. And a big thanks and shout out to DJ Eastwood, who of course runs Run It Back Philly, and was the inspiration for today's video. Because DJ, uh, we're linking to his video below, did a video recently on Gerson Yabaselli. He's obviously just formally signed with the 76ers. And he has officially left Real Madrid, so he is now a 76er. He's back in the NBA after, of course, five seasons back here in Europe. DJ had a lot of things he wanted to talk about in that video, and I figured, well, there's a few questions there. I can hopefully help answer them in a bit. But, uh, yeah, on that note, we're going to get right to it in a second. But before we do, please remember, subscribe, like, share, comment. All those interactions to help more people see this video and more people get to know the Ball on Europe channel. And yes, this is a Kent State Golden Flashes hat. I will explain more at the end of the video. So the big, big question with Gershon Yabaselli that, that DJ sorry, posted is, should he start? Uh, well, he really asked, can he start? And to me, it's can he and should he are two different level ones. Can he start? He has the capability to, definitely. Absolutely, no question. I think... He knows what's required conditioning-wise, physicality-wise, and in terms of just the overall level-wise that's needed at the NBA. We saw that in his performance against the USA in particular, but also against you know Canada as well. And he he showed out repeatedly in these in those Olympics, and we saw it even like you know in a Real Madrid jersey the last three seasons. So the can to me is solved. It's the should. Uh, is the other one and to me it's no and I have a pretty simple reason for that is you look at how he's actually been best used since he left the NBA now that he's going back there so when when Yabuselli first came back to Europe he had a very brief uh, partial season with Asvel before having a full season with them uh, four seasons ago started 26 of 30 did pretty good and uh, Real Madrid figured we like that we'll sign him he's very good he started 34 or 36 for them and uh, he was fine but then he moved into an off-the-bench role primarily. So he started just over half of his yearly games with them in the season they won the championship. And then this season just gone, just under half of them he started. So he's rotating between an off-the-bench and starting role, which I think is the type of role that he's going to adjust to well in the NBA, but more off the bench in my, for my money. And the reason for that is he's a change of pace. So he's got the calibers of the talent. But I'm looking, you know, I'm coaching the Sixers in a minute game. And... The team coaching playing against me, they figure they've just about figured things out and they're starting to find a way to interrupt the rhythm. You bring in Yabuselli, that change of pace he can bring, obviously the speed, the physicality, uh, the athleticism and also the three-point shot. He's changing things up. He's giving the opponents a new thing to factor in now when they're making those calculations on the court, trying to work out what works best. And that to me is where I'm seeing his best use. But likewise, Sixers are down. You know, they need to change something up. Well, this is a definite change in style. I mean, he's uh, bringing this burst of energy off the bench. That is exactly what you need. Not just to find new ways to create and score, but and to, and to create space as well. But also to really rev up the guys around you. Like, you know when Yabu's on the court, he is bringing some extra fire to those guys around him. And that to me means, like, I look at the most value I can get from him as a player. If I'm a Philadelphia 76ers fan. And I think springing off the bench uh, is the best. Like, we've seen it with some greats in the past. Like, you know, Manu Ginobili is probably the best example of it. But, uh, you know, obviously it's a very different role, I think it's fair to say. But I think off the bench, like, number one, starter-wise, you'll still get good NBA-level starter stuff from, from Yabu uh, at a ridiculously good contract, which we'll get to in our next section. Uh, but you're also going to, you know, you're going to just be missing out on the boost, the change of pace, and you're going to need that a, a lot in this season, uh, like every team always does. So, yeah, that's why I think he can start to the NBA level, but he should come off the bench. And now we get to numbers. So now we get to numbers, and there's two numbers to rediscuss, well, two groups of them. One is the financial, and the other is the statistical. And we're going to start with the financial because it's kind of interesting, but also brief. So the financial, some of you may have seen that Yabuselli's actually had to fork out a huge chunk of change himself as part of the buyout. That's obviously because there's NBA rules and how much a team can actually pay as part of a buyout itself. And Real Madrid, they've made a lot of money on selling on players because they, you know, they those releases are built in assuming you, the player, is going to pay that buyout. Uh, simple as that. So Yabu has taken a huge bet on himself. I think when it all comes down to it, after tax and everything, he will be paid 
uh, less than a million, I think, this year to be a sixer. Which, when you think about it, like, you know, okay, he's starting on a 2.1 million contract, but actually, no, it would be, after tax, it'll be a lot less than that again. So he's kind of having a close, well, I won't say free year, because still he'll still be getting paid more money than I ever get paid. But for considering what he can earn, yeah, it's basically a free year. Like, he's betting on himself to get that next contract. So big, big props to Yabu, who's, like, putting that money, his own money, literally, uh, you know, where his belief is. So now we get to the numbers which are, you know, were brought up by DJ in his video, more in terms of, you know, people asking it about him, not so much DJ commenting on himself, in that the translation of the numbers. So this is where basketball outside the NBA and the NBA aren't easy comparison stat-wise when it comes to the counting stats. So I'm talking minutes per game, points per game, uh, and your, you know, rebounds per game, APG, you know yourself. Uh, the raw counting stats. And... Yavaselli is 23 minutes a game in the EuroLeague for, for Real Madrid last year, uh, coming off the bench again, and uh, averaged an even 10 points per game in the EuroLeague regular season last season as well, which aren't exactly jumping off the page to you, which I understand. And I believe his rebounds is going to be even more frightening to you uh, until I explain them. So his total rebounds, sorry, because I've got to scroll here. Uh, his total rebounds per game, yeah, he averaged five rebounds a game in 23 minutes along with 10 points which you might go that's not great here's the thing there's a translation issue uh which essentially is down to the minutes actually kind of give it away and also usage essentially in europe so yeah what well, like the nba there is obviously more for the stars but there's a lot more feeding a lot more around the court in european ball so like the overplayed thing is that it's that europe we're all about the team sport and where you play a different basketball part of that is true a lot of it is wildly overhyped but the part that's most important here is that there is a lot more to go around in terms of the overall pie. So you and that leads to some real anom anomalies. And the other one to bear in mind is a game outside of the NBA, apart from the odd place, like I believe Philippines does it, is eight minutes shorter in overall time. So you're seeing far more use of the bench in terms of far more touches, far more usage, and also far less time as well. To the point of triple doubles, which you know are nice to get in the NBA, but happen a lot. When I say they're rare in Europe, I mean we have had, since EuroLeague uh, began this century under the EuroLeague name, uh, we're still under 10 total across the whole of it, ever. Like, obviously, EuroLeague was different competitions before then, but uh, we, I, I've been out, I, I went, went to one, the second most recent one, in 2019, and we hadn't had one for like a dozen years. Uh, in fact, I think if I'm doing it right, it's way, it's, it's way fewer than 10. I haven't got the number top of my head, unfortunately. I will put it in the comments below, or maybe in my caption, the exact number of, uh, of triple doubles in the early history will be in the caption here. So, but yeah, they don't happen often. Like they're a major event. And essentially that comes down again to the minutes and use thing. There are far fewer possessions in a game in Europe than in the NBA as well, because they tend to like sort of play that way. It's far less fast break ball, for example. So as a result, your stats are going to be negatively impacted by it in terms of the eyeball counting stats. And I've gone way long on this bit, but I'll wrap it up very quickly with these two key things. A very smart man I know called Zaman Yach, who's not really on the internet too much anymore, but still works uh, right about basketball he used to say that if you wanted to do the triple double for europe if you see seven 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 across the three big counting stats that largely translates to the nba but that was very rough napkin mats uh so that's the key thing to bear in mind there and the other one is just check the you know percentages efficiency that's where you want to see uh positive so obviously his shooting efficiency is good his rebound so his turnover assist is pretty solid as well so you know, he's efficient, he's secure with the ball. So they're the big things to bear in mind with Yabu Selly. Now we'll get back to a more interesting part. So there's another reason I think Gerson Yabu Selly should not start this season. And it's not just what we've already discussed at length really, which is that he's more used to coming off the bench in recent years. It's that it'll help him be more effective this season in Philadelphia in particular, because of course, this is his first year back in the NBA, and with any team, any league, any any format, there's an adjustment. Like, at the NBA, you know, you are playing a different schedule, It's uh, and it's far more travel. Like, there is a lot of travel around Europe, but like, Real Madrid play the vast majority of their games in Spain, like all their Spanish league games, and, you know, half of their EuroLeague games. And while there is a lot of travel, it's still not quite the same as the NBA. But also, there's a style and usage thing, which, will change but if he's coming off the bench more 
He's going to have more time to, you know, learn what he needs to do to adjust, to make himself more relevant in games. He's going to have more time, essentially, to get the feel for what his best way to contribute is and grow into that as the season goes on. And that also means you're going to be able to keep him fresh for the playoffs. Because a player with that level of physicality, that athleticism, but also that size, you don't want him running himself into the ground. You, you know, great, he has an amazing 82-game season, and then come, you know, the postseason, it's like, well... Gershon was good for us, I suppose. With that sash, no, with Gershon. Uh, you don't want that. I think you want, you know, your best players, and or even any player you want to contribute heavily to be in their peak shape come the playoffs. I believe that Gershon coming off the bench more often than not for Philly this year is the best way to guarantee that. And he's the type of guy, he loves the big moment. And I think, you know, if he starts to see his minutes increase as the playoffs progress, he's just going to grow and grow more into that role. And, I mean, we're assuming Philadelphia makes the playoffs in this video because, I mean, seriously, they're in the Eastern Conference, not, not the Western Conference this year. And that isn't a slight in the East. That's on the, the West is the one where you aren't sure which team's making the playoffs. The East is the one where there's a clear top level teams and Philadelphia is in that. Like, you know, anything less than a conference semifinals, y'all should be very annoyed. Frankly, you should be looking for a conference finals as well at minimum. But like, you know, that's the level we're here. If you're a first round exit, be very annoyed this season. Um, you're not one of those teams you should be discussing whether you're getting to the postseason or not. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, you'll get more out of him. He'll deliver more. And he'll really just be a good Philadelphia 76er and hopefully both you and him got along well enough that you decide to keep it going longer term. But that's it from this video for now. Thank you all so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, we had to do about three takes in the intro, by the way, because of traffic outside. That was wild. But I did mention earlier, I would mentioned this cap. So Kent State, go Flashes. Uh, so I have never gone to college in the US. I'm historically a Notre Dame fan. Uh, because I'm Irish, we used to see Notre Dame game fans on TV in Ireland. I actually worked at the uh, for the TV broadcast in Ireland of the college game we had a couple of weeks ago here in Dublin. That was cool. First time we ever did a college game with an Irish uh, production broadcast. Uh, we did it alongside ESPN, but I was speaking in Irish about uh, American football. But a good buddy of mine, anyway, uh, Scotty, he is a Kent State alum, uh, spent most of his life working with Turner in Atlanta, grew up originally in Rochester, New York, uh, then went to Kent for his university, became just a Kent State super fan. And back during the pandemic when I was like, doing videos about beer and stuff on a different channel, uh, he was loving the way I was wearing caps and all of them, and he insisted I wear a Kent State Golden Flashes cap for one, so I have for a few. And I finally got to see Kent, uh, the city and the team uh, play last year out in Toledo. So visited Kent, then we drove to Toledo to watch the game. Didn't go so well. But yeah, so go Flashes, as well as uh, all the best. Thank you all you Sixers fans who tuned in and all the non-Sixers fans who just like hearing about Gersh and Yabaselli or occasionally enjoy watching me talk. Uh, but for now, that's everything we've got. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And until next time, I'll see you soon.